It was great to be back with many of you last Sunday for our outdoor service. We had over 500 people covering our fields, parking lots, and, and definitely filling up the few shaded areas. We also had several hundred people online viewing this past weekend. And several of you who were new to us online, who had never been on our campus, you made the connection to us during COVID and you were bold enough to come to our outdoor service last Sunday. It was great to get to meet several of you. Thank you for being here. Now, as we move forward, a gradual plan to reopen, let me remind you of our schedule for the next few weeks. June 14th, today and the 21st, we'll have our service that you're watching online now at 9.30. And then at 11, those of you who desire to take an action step can join me and several of our other staff members outdoors on the field here at Rich Fork for a guided time of prayer. This time of prayer is purposeful. It is to prepare our hearts, minds, and souls for power and purpose. I'll remind you of this at the end of the message today. Then on June 28th, we are going to move indoor for two services, 9.30 and 11 a.m., both in our multi-purpose building. As we draw closer to that date, we'll continue to communicate with you the details about the date, changes to our building, seating capacity, and we'll also have our online service continue during the 9.30 service time. Now, as we move into our service time today, I know this is a little bit different. And I know there's many variables to you doing this in your own home or wherever you're watching. But I would love to challenge you to take a few moments to thank God for what he has done and is continuing to do in and around your family, your church, even your community during the past three months. If you're online with us at 930, then you could even post some things that you're thankful for in the live chat. So I wanna challenge you from the beginning, take one minute and thank God in your home. You may be alone, you may be with your family and friends. Take time and give thanks. God, at times, I believe we need to stop and be thankful. I was reminded of this this week as I walked through my house and my wife had put on one of our boards in our house reasons to be thankful and things to be thankful for. And it reminded me of even in the middle of this difficult season in our world, there are things that have happened daily in our home and around us with neighbors, with family that we are thankful for. God, as we have seen through our study of Acts, we are most thankful for the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. May that guide us as our power and our purpose as we continue to worship today. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that curse tree. His body bound and drenched in. Bye. 
Last Sunday at our outdoor service, we took a one-week break in our study of the book of Acts to explore a passage of scripture that we found and looked at in Exodus 32 and 33. So as we step back into Acts today, I want to remind you and review a few things that we've learned thus far in this study. We've witnessed a group of men and women who had encountered the living, breathing, miracle-working Jesus, and many of them had witnessed the death and resurrection of Jesus And because of that, they could not be swayed or tempted away from the message of Jesus Christ. They followed him from town to town. They listened. And then Jesus called a group of 12 of them that he would eventually allow them to step into and lead this Jesus movement. In chapter one of Acts, Jesus communicates to the early followers that they had power and they had a purpose. Scripture says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you 
and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. Power, the Holy Spirit entering their lives, guiding them, convicting them, revealing sin in their lives and offering freedom and the reminder of forgiveness through Jesus Christ. They were given power, but they were also given purpose to go in power and communicate what they had seen, what they had witnessed about Jesus to the lands and places around them and as far as God would challenge them and allow them to go. As the book of Acts continued, Jesus ascended into heaven. The Holy Spirit came upon the apostles and the 12 who'd walked with Jesus, they experienced several powerful miracle moments, to say the least. And Jerusalem, the epicenter of the Jewish culture, they began to experience a new movement, one of grace, one of compassion, one of love, one of truth. And this movement grew not by dozens of new followers, but by thousands. And as with any movement, it grows that quickly. There would be jealousy and misunderstanding, and eventually there would be hatred that led to the persecution of the early followers of Jesus. But they reacted strangely to the persecution. Chapter 5, verse 41 through 42 tells us the response of the early church after they had been imprisoned and beaten. It says, then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. Persecution had the opposite effect on the early church that the religious leaders anticipated. They had hoped for silence, but what they encountered with boldness. They desired the movement to disappear, fade away numerically, but instead it blossomed. Some would even say it exploded with growth. The growth occurred so quickly that the followers of Jesus had to shift how they were going to lead this new movement. And it's at that moment that we arrive in chapter six today. Verse one, now in those days when the disciples were increasing in number. Now, before we get to the heart of this passage, I, I want us to see that this section, verses one through seven, is bookended with two statements. It says the disciples were increasing in number. And then in verse seven, it says, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, he included 10 reminders of numerical growth in the church. Now, I'm no scholar, but if an author includes something 10 times, then it must be important. Luke counted and included references to numbers because behind each number was a person. Each number was a life, a story, who needed to hear the life-saving truth of Jesus Christ. Years ago, as a student pastor, I took a group of almost 80 students and adults to a youth camp in South Carolina. Side note, I survived. I bet we counted that group of students a hundred times. When we arrived home, I am certain that when I lay down in bed that night, I could have counted them all in my sleep with my eyes closed because we counted them at night. We counted them in the morning. If we traveled somewhere, we would recount them. If we stopped for lunch for the restrooms, you know why we counted? Because they were someone else's son and daughter. And I am certain that they wanted me to count and bring back all 80 people. Each week at Rich Fork, we, we try to get a general count of the people in attendance in this room and the other rooms. Because the truth is that behind each of those numbers is a person with a story, with a need. And our desire is to communicate to every single person that entrusts, that God entrusts us with, the hope that we have in Jesus. 
Luke included repeatedly the church increased in number. Why? Because behind every number is a person. And people are important to us because they're important to God. And our desire is to shape our community by sharing the grace of Jesus Christ. And our community is filled with people. And these people are important. Every single one of them. You. You're important to the creator of the universe. He shaped you. He created you. He formed you. And he offered his son, Jesus Christ, as a payment for your sins. Speaking of numbers, scripture says, God knows the number of your days. He knows the number of the hairs on your head. He knows you. He loves you. Therefore, we love you as well. People are important to us because they're important to God. We strive towards biblical growth, not simply a number, led and built on the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, as this chapter unfolds, we see something transpire, which makes me love the book of Acts even more. Because the church, the followers of Jesus, the disciples of Jesus were perfectly imperfect. They experienced this phenomenal growth, but they also had difficulties which arose with this growth. And this is what we're going to see today in this section of Acts. Scripture says, Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because of their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, Parmenas, Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. They set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Here's their struggle. A group of people called the Hellenists. They are Greek-speaking Jews. They felt that their widows were not being cared for in the same way as the Hebrew-speaking widows. We read in other scripture that caring for widows is an important facet of the church. So it's a valid concern. But it gets more complicated because these two groups of people were not only separated by language, but by culture the Hellenists were viewed as second-class citizens. When they committed their lives to Christ, they were immediately part of the same movement as the Jewish people who had also committed their lives to Christ. And in one quick moment, they were now all a part of one big, happy, huge, ever-increasing numerical family. But right now, they're not real happy. But what I want to highlight for you today is how did the early church respond? This difficulty in the early church was addressed immediately, concisely, and carefully by the leaders of the church and those gathering that day. They were not going to allow this moment to cause dissension in the church, nor were they going to allow it to hinder the preaching of God's word. This situation was an opportunity to exercise their faith. And please hear me. It was an opportunity to exercise their faith, not only their faith in God, but this was an opportunity for them to exercise their faith in each other. What was being mishandled was a ministry of care and compassion. What was being hampered was the preaching of the word. What was being threatened was the unity of the church. What was at risk was the purpose of the early church. The solution, allow the power to lead us to a solution. In verse 2, the apostles essentially said, guys, we can't do it all. They're not saying they are better than anyone else or are above serving tables, but they are saying that they have been given a distinct calling to preach the word and to share the stories of Jesus and lead, make disciples, 
of more and more men and women. Verse three is their solution. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. Look at the list of qualifications for servants. They chose to care for the needs of others. A good reputation. These men were going to have the responsibility to care for people, but also have the opportunity to collect money, purchase the items needed to care for people. They had to have good reputations, integrity in their community. But they also had two more significant qualifications for taking on this role. They were to be full of the Spirit. I love this inclusion because you might think, as I have at times in life, why does someone serving a table need the Holy Spirit? Now, if you've ever waited on tables for a living, you know that you need the Spirit of God to keep you in check. I've done it. But seriously, we are prone to think that preachers are full of the Spirit. Worship leaders are full of the Spirit. But God's standard is that every one of us who serves, who loves, who cares, or preaches must lead and serve from the position of being filled with the Spirit of God to be effective in whatever ministry you are called. I love this quote I read in preparation for today. It said, the conclusion of this passage is that there are these members who need the same divine power source to serve bread as the apostles needed to preach the living bread. Who are the apostles suggesting to fill this significant role, to care for the widows, but also to bring a gospel-centered solution to the problem? They had to be full of good reputation, full of the Spirit, and full of wisdom. They had to have the ability to judge correctly and follow the best course of action based on knowledge and understanding. But this word for wisdom would have been a word of wisdom of practical ability, how to manage, how to make decisions, but also the understanding of the movement and the power of God. It was a both and. It's an incredible reminder to me that God's word included this conflict in the church, but also how the apostles would continue to preach the message. And the people in the church must be cared for, counseled, ministered to, But the church cannot allow dissension to sidetrack it from purpose to be witnesses of Jesus. There was a problem, there was a godly solution, and there was a beautiful conclusion. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. There's the unity of purpose. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, They sat before the apostles and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And verse seven, here's the conclusion. And the word of God continued to increase. And the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great number, many of the priests became obedient to the faith. What was being mishandled was a ministry of care and compassion. The church agreed upon a solution. What was being hampered was the preaching of the word. The decision allowed this to continue and expand. What was being threatened was the unity of the church. What was at risk was the purpose of the early church. The solution allowed the power to lead them to the solution. The result, the continued spread of the grace-filled message of Jesus Christ. And it even expanded, not only to the people of Jerusalem, but the leaders, the priests as well. Unity in the church protects the purpose of the church. Today, I want to shift from teaching time to a thankful time. As I stated in my sermon last Sunday, March 11th changed our world, all of our lives. Now, I don't want to take time to recount all of those moments from last week, but in reality, the church encountered a shift that we've never encountered in my lifetime. How are we to be the church when we have to leave the building? 
How do we balance safety for our church members and for our community and maintain power and purpose? Because within a week's time, we were faced with many decisions to meet, not to meet, when to meet, how to meet, where to meet, when to allow groups to meet, who can use the building? How do we set up for our staff meeting? How do we have staff meeting? How can we be in the building? Who can be at the building at the same time? How do we help our community? How do we help hurting church members, families, widows, shut-ins, hospitals? How do we take up offerings? What about weddings, funerals? Those are just some of the decisions that we're we faced and continue to face. And I don't share those as complaints, just facts. But what I want to do today is thank you as a congregation, even as a community, because you've exercised grace, patience, and support for your church leadership in many ways. I expressed to you in an email several weeks ago that what has amazed me thus far in the process of COVID-19 is the unity in our staff, our deacons, our core volunteers, our committees that have continued to meet, the ministry that has continued to occur. Why? Because the spirit of unity allowed it to happen. And unity in the church protects the purpose of the church. I realize there are those watching this message that have strong opinions about when we should meet sooner, later, never, no one's ever suggested that, but in all of your comments to me, you've done so with a spirit of trust and support. Just as the early church allowed their situation to create a change for the good of the people and for the purpose of the gospel, it also gave them an opportunity to trust each other more. This situation, COVID-19, has been and continues to be an opportunity to exercise our faith our faith in God, but also our faith in each other. Now, I know we've missed some key areas of ministry. We know that. We tried to address those and we'll continue to do so. But what we have done online and in person through emails, Zoom groups, and chats is to proclaim the power and purpose of the church of Jesus Christ. And that is possible because you've trusted us. Even when you may not have agreed with us and you may have had a better idea, you still trusted us. But also know we've done our best to listen to you, to your suggestions, your desires, your hopes. And while we have not tackled all of them perfectly, we have listened. And we've, we've asked that when we're able to meet again in person, that our church will be stronger, more purposeful, and clinging to the power of the Holy Spirit more than ever because we've walked this journey in unity. In and through your unity, you have sent cards of encouragement. You've read countless emails. You've watched more video announcements than you ever desired to watch. You have clicked to watch almost 14,000 service views in 13 weeks. Now, this is astounding to think of, that if each of those views is a home in Davidson County and the average household in our county is comprised of 2.4 people, then that could possibly mean that 2,500 people a week are watching our services online. That is possibly a 100% increase in church attendance since we've left the building. You've given faithfully, as of last week, we are still 10,000 above our budget needs for the year. You've clicked and you've shared hundreds of links to various online groups and things we've provided. You've helped us through your giving, serve 100 meals a week to a group of our shut-ins and widows in our church. You've allowed us to serve hundreds of meals to healthcare workers, thank you bags, gifts of homemade jam given to over 50 church members who are also educators to encourage them, countless gift cards to various church members whose work has been interrupted and halted by COVID. You've allowed us to use online services to have 15 people commit their lives to Jesus Christ. You've delivered meals. You've taken people to doctor's visits. You sat outside in the blazing heat because you missed the corporate worship, the gathering of believers 
And last Sunday, almost 400 homes also watched online. And as your pastor and a leader of our staff, I simply want to say thank you for protecting the unity of Rich Fork. Unity in the church protects the purpose of the church. And I pray that God continues to bring people to Rich Fork because your spirit, your attitude of unity during a season of unparalleled trials. One of the struggles we faced in the past three months, COVID, our church leaders agreed to a solution. What could have hampered the preaching of the message of Jesus Christ instead launched it into unknown living rooms. And that decision allowed us to continue to expand. What was at risk? The purpose of the church, shaping by sharing. The solution and the attitude produced unity. And the result is the continuing spread of the grace-filled message of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you for trusting and having faith in God. But also, thank you for having faith in us. We have been since March 11th, much like the early church, perfectly imperfect. Thank you. So a few action steps for today. First, begin praying for our time of worship together on June 28th. Now, our desire that Sunday is to move indoors at 9.30 and 11 a.m., but begin praying for the logistics, yes. Decisions, yes. Cleaning, arranging, but more importantly, for each of us to be servants of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, and of wisdom as we prepare for that day. A second action step is this. Read Acts 6 and 7 in preparation for our teaching time next Sunday. We have a lot of ground to cover, and it is a powerful moment in the history of the church. The last action step is a big one. It requires you to leave your home. Action step, join us for a time of prayer at 11 a.m. today, June 14th, on the field behind Rich Fork. We will have a time of prayer to begin preparing us for the weeks of worship to come. Because not only do we want to be prepared and physically prepared to protect and keep germs from spreading when we meet and all the logistics, but we want to be spiritually prepared, distinct, and ready for what God has for our church in the future. I look forward to joining at 11 a.m. in just a few moments with one of you or 500 of you for this action step at 11 a.m. today on the field at Rich Fork. Let's pray. God, I thank you for being a part of the body of believers called Rich Fork. The incredible gift of serving as the pastor here. And God, while we could have been consumed with so many different things the last three months, dealing with coronavirus, I'm so thankful that those that are listening have trusted us as leaders and staff and deacons and pastors to make decisions and to lead. Knowing that we, our desire is to bring people into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I am so thankful that that spirit of unity has allowed that to happen. When we look at Acts 6, 1 through 7, and we see that you increased the number of the people. It happened before this moment of disagreement and struggle, and it happened after. Why? Because they protected the unity of the church, the power and the purpose. And may we set the same example in our culture, in our world, in our community. Thank you, God, for this gift and for this challenge from the book of Acts. In Jesus' name, amen.